I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to say something before I preach my message uh, to somebody maybe watching via live stream. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I got to the point where um, I was going through such a trial, such a difficult time, and as a young person, as a teenager, I didn't realize that it would pass. I didn't know how to deal with the trials and the pressure of my life. And I want to be honest with you, I wanted to end my life. It was so painful. But I'm so glad I didn't. I'm so glad that at 19 I gave my life to Jesus. And as a result of that, the Lord gave me purpose. He gave me meaning. And today, I have a beautiful wife. I have three beautiful daughters. I have two granddaughters. I have one grandson on the way. I have a wonderful church. And my life is not perfect, but I thank God that God held me and he gave me grace. I say that to tell somebody that's here today, whether you're a young person, whether you're middle-aged, whether you're older, it's going to get better. Hang in. Hold on. God's got a plan. Amen? Whoever that's for, please hold on to that. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Don't forget to tune in to 570 MCA today. Uh, I'll be on the radio. We started a brand new program called Overcomers. And uh, would you pray? Pray that the Lord would bless it, that thousands of people would hear the message of the gospel and they would respond. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This morning, I want to continue my series entitled God's Unchanging Promises. And I want to talk to you today about the promise that God makes us that he will provide for all of our needs. It's the promise of provision. In fact, the Bible is filled with stories of people who believe that God was their provider. It begins with Abraham when Abraham is climbing the mountain. And the Bible tells us that God said to Abraham, take your only son and sacrifice your son. Now, that's a difficult story, but it's a story of trust. It's a story of surrender. It's a story of believing that God would provide. The Bible says that when Abraham was walking up the mountain, his son said to him, Dad, where is the lamb? And Abraham made that incredible statement, God will provide. That's where we get the term Jehovah Jireh. Our Lord is our provider. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <laughs> I won't have any wants because I know that the Lord is my provider. Elijah witnessed the hand of God in a tremendous way as the ravens brought him food every single day. The people of Israel witnessed God providing for them as they wandered through the desert. God always provided for them in every way. James tells us every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. And the truth is, there are those that are here this morning, maybe you're watching via live stream today, Maybe you're in the cafe, wherever you are today, you are wondering how are you going to get through a very difficult situation in your life. You're wondering, God, how am I going to provide for my family? You're saying to God, God, time is running out. Money is running out. Resources are running out. Lord, please see to it that you provide for me. This morning, God wants you to know that he's going to meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. That God is going to open the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. That God wants you to live in peace and not in worry and fear. In fact, Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Where is it not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So Jesus tells us, don't worry about the things in life. Why? Because you're much more valuable to God than anything else in the world. 
That if God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, Jesus said, if God provides for the birds of the air, how much more will God give you what you need? Jesus said, your father knows what you need. Your father knows not only what you need, but is willing to meet every need, every day, every concern, every situation. God is willing to meet your needs. And Paul the Apostle tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's break that down for a moment. Paul said, my God, Paul knew that his God would do it, will, my God will. Everybody say, my God will. Paul didn't say, maybe God's going to provide for your needs. He didn't say, if he's in the mood, he'll provide for your needs. He didn't say that if you're a good person, he'll provide for your needs. God said, I will provide for your needs. I will that he wills to provide for you. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter six, when you pray, ask God to meet your daily needs. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. If Jesus told you to ask, don't you think that he knows that God wants to provide for you and I? Somebody help me out and say amen today. Jesus said in John chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus says, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it, why? He says, so that my Father may be glorified. That when Jesus gives us something, he gives it to us because he wants his father to be glorified. John chapter 16, Jesus said, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. In fact, Jesus says, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and the door will be open. Now in the Greek, it means you just keep on asking, you keep on seeking, and you keep on knocking. Why? Because you know that you know that God wills to give you that which you need. First John chapter 5 tells us, this is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So if God hears us, and if God is willing to provide for our daily needs, then we need to then with confidence know that he will do it. First Corinthians says, he did not spare his own son, but delivered him over to us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? It's the how much more is of scripture, where God literally tells us that he wants to give to us, and then he gives us the comparison. He says, Paul the apostle tells us that if God did not spare his son, if God gave us his very best, will he not also give you what you need? Secondly, Paul tells us God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Not our wants, but our needs. Now, that's really important, isn't it? Because sometimes we think a want is a need. Amen? Lord, I need a second car, Lord. Lord, I need another boat, Lord. I just need it, you know, I need, a, I, I need a bigger house, Lord. No, that's not a need, that's a want, and God never promised us that he would provide all of our wants. You know why? Because sometimes we get spoiled, huh? Come on, somebody. Sometimes God knows that if he gives you what you want, it's not the best thing for you. Come on, somebody. If I gave my children everything, they wanted when they were little, they wouldn't be around today. Come on, somebody. If I gave them everything they wanted when they were little, it would have hurt them. So thank God that God has wisdom. You know, it's the wisdom of God and the will of God that blesses us in our life. Not just his will, but his wisdom. He knows when, 
He knows how, he knows why, he says yes, and he knows when and how and why. He says no sometimes, why? Because he knows the future of our lives. He loves us more than we love ourselves. Come on, somebody say thank God that God knows me better than I know myself. But, but Paul the apostle does promise us this one thing, that God will supply all our needs. What do you need right now? Do you need strength to face another day? Do you need wisdom to make the right decision in business? Do you need joy for the journey? Do you need financial help and assistance for your family? Do you need healing for your body? Do you need a, a freedom from addiction to drugs and alcohol or whatever addiction that you have in your life? Do you need direction for your life? Do you need power from the Holy Spirit? Do you need daily provision? Then you can know that it's God's will to provide for you. You see, the Bible tells us if we know the will of God and we pray the will of God, then we can be confident that he hears us. And if he hears us, he'll answer us. So all you have to do is look in the scripture and find, is it God's will to provide for my daily needs? Is it God's will to heal my body? Is it God's will to give me peace? Is it God's will to give me joy? Yes, in all these situations and circumstances, it is a resounding yes in Christ Jesus. Somebody help me out today what is it that you need from the Lord right now Paul tells us that God is willing to meet all of our needs now I want you to notice what he says according to his riches in glory I'm so glad that Paul said according to his riches in glory listen to me his riches are inexhaustible his riches are unlimited his riches are endless his riches are never ending the Bible tells us the, the earth belongs to God and everything in it all of the world is his he is the one who pushes the oceans back and lets it dry again and appear again. You know, listen, the truth of the matter is, is I'm so glad that Paul the Apostle said, according to his riches in glory, God is rich. God owns everything. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. God, he can give you what you need because he owns it all. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Glory to God. And all of these riches are found in Christ Jesus. That's the most important part of this whole thing. Is that all the riches of God are now found in Christ Jesus. All the riches of God are accessible to us in his son, Jesus Christ. How much more will God give us all these things because we are in Christ today? I want you to notice what Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Who is he talking about? Jesus and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. In who? In Jesus. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, For all the promises of God are yes in Christ. Come on, let's repeat that together. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. One more time. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. And so through him, our amen is spoken to what? To the glory of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of of glory hallelujah Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 Paul says I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling 
What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Everything, my friend, that you need is found in Jesus. Hallelujah. Everything that you need is contained, held together, supported, and found in Jesus. Aren't you glad for Jesus today? Why don't you just throw up your hands right now and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that everything I need is found in you. Hallelujah. Do you need peace today? It's found in Jesus. Do you need hope today? It's found in Jesus. Do you need strength today? It's found in Jesus. Do you need wisdom and healing? Do you need grace and freedom? Do you need daily provisions? It's all found in Jesus. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, Verily, verily, I tell you the truth. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Wow. Wow. We, we need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded that God wills to provide for us. We need to be reminded that God wills to provide all of our needs. We need to be reminded that God provides all of our needs and through his riches in glory, and that is in the glory of Christ Jesus. It's all found in Jesus. But let's get practical now. How does God provide for our needs? I want you to write this down because I believe that God primarily provides for our needs in four ways. The first way that God provides for our needs is miraculously intervening with a miracle. God does it himself. God just comes down and spectacularly, sometimes even mystically, provides for a need that we have in our life. He, 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 he creates, a, we call that a miracle, where God creates a miracle in our life. He just comes down and does it himself. You know, the pastor of this church, who was basically the founder of this church, Pastor Moriello, actually became a pastor because he was on his deathbed. He was dying of tuberculosis. And he cried out to the Lord, and he said, Lord, if you heal me, I will go into the ministry. And God reached down and miraculously healed him. And as a result of that, he went into the ministry and founded this church. Come on, somebody. God sometimes reaches down and does it himself. I heard a story of a young girl who, who fell. It's a movie that's out today uh, that she fell headfirst into a tree. She actually she fell into the hollow of the tree. And uh, while she was in the hollow of the tree, literally 30 feet down, head first, she, um, she actually saw a vision, and the Lord brought her into heaven, and the Lord spoke to her and said, you're going to go back to earth because you've got a lot of work to do. And so the firemen came and actually raised her out. When, they, when she got out of the tree, she had no injuries, and the, actually the, the firemen and, and everyone that was around warned the parents that probably when they pulled her out of the tree that she would be a vegetable. And yet she came out of the tree, and she was not injured. And, uh, but she had been suffering for years with um, some very difficult sicknesses in her body. She was instantly healed by the power of God, um, as a result of that situation. You say, why, God, why did God allow it that, that way? I don't know, but God did it. And I know that there are people in this room today that God miraculously intervened in your life and created a miracle. How many of you have experienced the intervention of God, a miracle in your life? I mean, you can say, that was a miracle that happened. I remember praying for my mom. She had a lump on her breast, and they wanted to uh, do surgery. And I, I remember praying for two weeks and fasting. And when she went back, it was completely gone. God still does miracles. And I hear stories all the time of how God does miracles. People come to Bethlehem, and we're just having worship times. And they call me, and they let me know, you know, God touched me. God can touch you today. He can do it himself. 
So number one, God does it himself. He miraculously comes down and intervenes and creates a miracle. Number two, God provides through man. God pro provides through others. Now, why does God provide through others? Because God wants us to love each other. And I tell you what, when God provides through somebody, it makes me love them more. It's just the way it is. That's the way that God created things, that we are interdependent on one another, that we really need one another. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, I really need you. I really need you. You know, the Bible talks about the body of Christ, right? 1 Corinthians 12, we're all a part of the body of Christ. And every one of us are a part of a wonderful body, the body of Christ. And the Bible says the ear cannot say to the eye, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. This is just the way it is. And so God actually sometimes creates needs in our life because he wants us to be interdependent on other people. No, what would it be like? What kind of world would we live in if we didn't need each other? Come on, somebody. What kind of world would we live in if we didn't need one another? We wouldn't really love one another. You know, I, I want to tell you that there were many times in my life where people provided. They came through, and they provided for me. I, I remember as a, as a young student in Bible college, I would come home from the from Bible college on the weekends and work at Bethlehem Assembly of God as an intern and then as a youth pastor. And I'll never forget, there was one Christmas where my wife and I, we were working really hard, but we were short $850 in our school bill. And they called me in the office and they said, Steve, if you don't come back with $850, you can't come back to school. And I said, Lord, you've got to provide. And I had about a week off from school, and I'll never forget that this gentleman came over to me after church one day, and he said, Steve, he said, don't lose your jacket today. You know, back then we used to wear jackets to church. And so he said, I wouldn't lose your jacket today. And so I went home, and I looked at my jacket. I kid you not when I tell you, nobody told this gentleman. He knew nothing about my need there was $850 in my jacket, hallelujah. Now, now, God told them that, but he was the one who was obedient to God. Now, God didn't supernaturally put $850 in my jacket. He didn't send an angel, he didn't say, hey, do me a favor, go down to earth and, and take this envelope to Steve Malazzo, no, 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 no. He used a man to provide for me. I will never, ever forget that day. I will never forget the day that God whispered to me and said, I will provide for all of your needs according to my riches in glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Steve, don't ever worry. If you seek first my kingdom, I will provide for every need that you have. And I want to tell you that God has been so faithful to me over the years. Sometimes he divinely intervenes and does things that no man can do. But most of the time, he will send a man or a woman, someone who will encourage my heart, that will help me to know that God hears my prayers. Come on, somebody, help me out today. Number, number three, sometimes God provides through actually closing a door, that God sometimes actually creates a problem because he wants to close a door so that he can open another door in our life. <laughs> sometimes he shuts down that provision in our life because he wants to do something new in our life. Sometimes he, he allows our brook to run dry, hallelujah because we've become too accustomed to go to the brook and not to God. We've, we, we've started to lean 
harder on the brook. We started to lean harder on the provision than on God who is the provider. We forget that God is the provider. Or maybe we've gotten so comfortable with the provision that we're not trusting God and living by faith any longer because we've got it all figured out. I get up in the morning, every morning, and I go down to the brook and I get some water from the brook and I get up every morning and the ravens come and they feed me what I need and so I'm just gonna chill out, I'm just gonna have a good time feeding off of the provisions of the Lord and we forget that God has another task for us. We forget that God wants us to live by faith. Well, that's what happened to Elijah. Elijah's in the desert and the Bible says that God provides for Elijah. He says to Elijah, I know there's a famine in the land, but I will always provide for you. Go and sit here and I will provide for you. I will send the ravens to feed you. The Bible says that every day Elijah received what he needed. But the Bible says sometime later the brook ran dry. Sometime later God stopped providing in that way because he wanted to provide in another way. Listen to me. You might be facing a situation in your life where God closed up the brook He made it run dry, and you're worried, and you're thinking, God, you don't care for me. God always cares for you. He knows everything that's happening in your life. But get ready, because God is about to do something new and fresh in your life. Hallelujah. He's going to use someone else. He's going to use something else in your life to provide what you need. The Bible says that the brook ran dry. So Elijah said, what do I do next, Lord? Hallelujah. Maybe some of you in this room, you're saying, what do I do next, Lord? The Bible says that the Lord spoke to to Elijah and said, go to this place, and when you get there, there'll be a widow, and she will provide for you. Check out what God is doing. He's so sovereign. He's so wise. He's so awesome. The Bible says that he gets to this town, and there's a widow, the widow of Zarephath. And he says to the widow of Zarephath, give me something to eat. And she says, I've got nothing for you but a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, and I'm going to make this cake, and then I'm going to die. But Elijah said to the woman, if you give me what you have, you'll never run out. You see, God sent Elijah to tell this woman, listen, God is a God of miracles, and if you trust them, if you give them the little you have, God's going to bless you. And so what happens? God shows this woman through Elijah's need what to do and how to live her life. Friend, sometimes God shuts something down because he wants you to go somewhere else because he wants you to help somebody out. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Glory to God. And together, Elijah and the woman of Zarephath began a relationship, a godly, holy relationship. You know the story after that. The woman, the same woman now, has a child. God does a wonderful work in the life of this woman and her husband and her children, and God does an incredible work. But you see, it could have never happened unless Elijah was willing to leave and trust God. Friend, you've got to be willing to leave this place and trust God. Maybe your brook has run out, but God will never run out. Maybe your brook has run out and you're wondering, where do I go next? God will show you where you go. But I'm here to tell you, if your brook ran dry, there's a miracle coming. There's something else coming down the road. There's something better in your life because God will never forsake you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll always provide. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Come on, somebody. Help me out and say thank you, Lord. But I believe that One of the most powerful ways that God provides for us is through us. So the fourth way that God actually provides for us is when we give God something to work with. I believe that God provides for us through us. Come on, say that with me. God provides for us through us. You see, the seed is already there. I always say there's a seed of greatness in all of us, but the seed is already there. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Come on, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to mark this up because this is a powerful, powerful scripture. 
Paul the Apostle says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Everybody say, God loves a happy giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way. Notice the words, in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will re result in thanksgiving to God. He's talking about giving. He's talking about giving to the poor. He's talking about giving to God. He's talking about tithing. He's talking about being generous. And Paul the Apostle says, God has given you a seed. And he says, if you give little, you will get little. If you give much, you will get much. God loves a happy, cheerful giver. That God loves when we're generous. And so verse 8 says, God is able to bless you abundantly. Everybody say abundantly. abundantly. He says he will supply seed to the sower and bread for food, real resources, and he will increase your store of seed, and he will enrich you in every way. Everybody say, every way. So you can be generous. That's the reason. Paul says God is going to increase your seed so that you can be generous. Now, God's going to give you all kinds of things. He's not only talking about money. God's going to give you grace. And when you get grace, what are you going to do with it? You're going to give grace. God's going to give you an abundant forgiveness. And what do you do with that forgiveness? You give forgiveness. God's going to give you mercy. And what are you going to give? Abundance of mercy. God's going to give you a seed. God's going to give you wealth. He's going to give you finances. And what are you going to do with it? You're going to share your wealth and your finances with others. Why? Because he said, the reason why I'm giving you this is so that you can be generous. Generosity is the plan of God. God wants his people to be generous. Come on, say with me. God wants me to be generous. So I want to give you for a few moments nine promises real quick when it comes to being generous. Number one, write this down. God promises when I give, I will receive more in return. That's what he promises. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 verse 38, give and it will be given back to you in full measure. What you receive will need to be pressed down and shaken together. But it still will run over and pour into your lap. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. Wow. I mean, that's just the principle. You can't get away from that principle that when you're generous to the poor, when you're generous to others, when you give out of a generous heart, I'm not only talking about money. I'm talking about everything in life. You give a smile, what do you get? A smile. Let's practice right now. Give somebody a smile. Look, you got it back, didn't you? You got it back. You give somebody love, you get love back. He said, if you give, it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You know, in the fall time, I do 
leave raking. And I put the leaves in the garbage can, and they're high. They're all the way up to the, but then I jump into the garbage can, and I press it down so that I can get more leaves in the container. God said, I'm going to give you so much that you're going to have to jump into the container and press it down so that you can get more. And still, he said, it's going to overflow. Come on. Somebody say, God's going to bless me, and I'm going to overflow. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Proverbs eleven twenty four. some people give generously and end up with more, while others don't give what they should and end up poor. Wow. Wow. That rhymes. Some people give generously and end up with more, while others don't give what they should and end up poor. Wow. Number two, God promises when I give, he will supply all my needs. Now, I want you to understand that the context of Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, is that the people of Philippi wanted to give to Paul. Paul was in prison. Paul was doing the work of the kingdom. Paul had needs. And Paul said, we need to take offerings so that we can bless Jerusalem. We need to take offerings so that we can bless the world. And there were some churches that were stingy. They didn't give anything. Friend, I want to tell you, the reason why Bethlehem Assembly of God is so absolutely blessed. I mean, we are pressed down, shaken together, and running over. 26 years ago, God told me to be generous to give away our money, and we've given away $14 million to missions. I mean, just giving, building, building. In a couple of weeks, I'll be traveling to Cuba, and I'll be dedicating the fourth church that we built in Cuba. Come on, somebody. I mean, listen, you, you give enough money to build churches in Cuba. We give them enough money to build a church, and then we go back there with a team, and we help work and then we dedicate the church. Come on, somebody. We're going to be exciting. It's going to be so exciting to see what God's done. But we've done that all over the world. And the reason why we're so blessed as a church is because we've always applied the principle of giving. That we always give. We give above and beyond. And as God has promised us, if we seek first his kingdom, then God will provide for all of our needs. He has met all of our needs. Somebody help us out and say amen. amen. But you see here, Paul the apostle tells the Philippians, he says, because you were so generous. And so, so this church was a generous church. It was very poor, very poor church, but it actually begged Paul to give. I want to give. And so they gave. And so Paul receives their gift and writes in Philippians chapter 4, he says, man, your gift is so wonderful. It's like, it's like incense to God. It, it was beautiful what you did. You gave out of your need. You gave out of your poverty. You were like that woman with the two little coins, and you threw it in the offering. And he said, because, because you did that, my God now shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You know, the truth is it was a promise to them. But because we can look in the scriptures and we can find that God says, when we give, it shall be given back to us, that we can apply that promise to us now, that as I give, God will provide all my needs according to his riches in glory. Number three, God promises that what we give to him will exponentially multiply. In other words, if we give God a seed, God will turn it into a harvest. If we place a seed in God's hands, he'll turn it into a miracle. We all remember the story of when Jesus was about to feed the 5,000 men plus women and children, 25 plus thousand people. What did Jesus do? I mean, Jesus could have said, Father, he did it, he did it once before, Father, send manna down from heaven. I mean, Jesus, let's just do this the easy way. We'll have everyone sit down, open their mouth, and you'll just send manna right down from heaven. He did that once before, didn't he, with the Israelites. He literally sent manna down from heaven. It was a miracle where God just sent bread down from heaven. 
But he didn't do it that way, did he? Jesus was looking for someone to give him something. And he saw that little boy, and that little boy came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I've just got five loaves of bread and a couple of sardines, and I'll give it to you. And what did Jesus do with the five loaves of bread and the couple of fishes? He took it and did what? He multiplied it. Friend, when you give God the little that you have, he always exponentially multiplies it and not only blesses you, but blesses everyone else in the house. Come on, somebody say amen. Your jar will never run dry when you give what belongs to God. Come on, somebody. Number four, God promises he will bless your work and your business when you give. Wow. Do you want your business to be blessed? Let me tell you, I want to be honest with you. Some folks are waiting for God to bless them, and then they will be a blessing to others. He's waiting for God to bless their business so that they can bless others. That's not how it works. If you want your business to be blessed, you have to bless God and others first. You sow your seed into God's kingdom. Now, I'm not suggesting that you give the money to me. I'm suggesting that you give it to the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. I want you to notice what it says. It says, honor the Lord by giving him the first part of your income. That's called the tithe. That's called 10%. So the first thing you do when you get $100 is you take $10 and you say, this belongs to the kingdom. Very biblical principle found in the scriptures. You take $10 from the $100 and you give it to the kingdom. And where do you bring it? Well, the Bible's clear. You bring it into the storehouse. And what is the storehouse? It's the local church. And the local church then takes that resource and gives it to the poor. That local church takes the resources and builds the kingdom of God. That local resource builds churches. That local resources helps the needy. That local resource has hope days, has all kinds of resources available to meet the needs of the poor, right? So what we do, we take those, that, that tithe, that 10%, the first tenth. The Bible tells us that it's the first fruit of our labor, and we give it to the Lord. Why is that important? Because when we're doing that, what we're really communicating to God is you come first. It's not, Lord, I'm going to spend my money, and if I have a little left over, I'm going to give it to you. Huh? I'm reminded of the story of the woman who gave her son two quarters. And she said, son, I want you to take one quarter, and I want you to put it in the offering in Sunday school. And the other quarter, you could do whatever you want with it. Well, he was walking down the street flipping the quarter in the, in the air, flipping the quarter in the air, and the quarter went, and he went to catch it, and it fell in the sewer, and he said, oh, Lord, there's your quarter, sorry. <laughs> That's the way we treat God, amen? That God gets the last. You see, tithing is all about God gets the first, hallelujah. God gets the first. When you give him the first, this is what he says, then your barns, your barns, what is he talking about? Your business, your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will overflow your business with the finest of wines, Proverbs 3, 9. A generous man will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed, Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. Number five, God promises that good things will come to you when you are generous. Good things, all kinds of of good things will come to you when you're generous. Psalms 11, or Psalms 112 says, good will come to him who is generous. Let's say that together. Good will come to me when I'm generous. Let's say that again. Good will come to me when I'm generous. Proverbs 22, 9 says, generous people will be blessed. Wow. What does the word bless mean? Well, number six, God promised you will be happier if you give. That you will actually be a happier person when you give. Acts chapter 20 says, remember the words of our Lord Jesus himself who said, there is more happiness in giving than receiving. So the word blessed means to be happy. Did you ever notice that 
you're a happy person when you give. Hmm? Did you ever notice that? I mean, you're not happy when you're fighting with God. You know, when God tells you, give this away. You know, there are things that God told me to give away. You know, every once in a while, I'll be on the mission field and God will say, you see that nice suit that you have? Give it away. Oh, but God, that's a really nice suit, you know. You know, God will tell me, hey, listen, give, give some money away. You know, release something, whatever it is, whatever it is. I, I remember when uh, years ago I decided that I was actually going to give away people. Now, how do you give away people? Well, I decided that we were going to plant churches, that we were going to give away pastors, we were going to give away money, we were going to give away people for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God. And I'll never forget the first time we planted our first church. <laughs> the church was full. I mean, the balcony was packed out with people. And on that, that day when I gave away people, when I say I gave away people, I released them. I said, listen, you can go with this pastor. No strings attached, right? And I'll never forget, I looked at the balcony. It was empty. And I said, Lord, I hope I did the right thing. <laughs> Do you know since then the balcony has been full and overflowing and overflowing? And now we have to have an overflow down in the cafe. And God is doing a great work. And we're having to buy a new building here or there. Why? Because you can never outgive God. And let me tell you something. Years later, 15 years later, I'm a happy man. Hallelujah. I wasn't so happy that morning when I looked at the balcony. I said, Lord, I hope I did the right thing. But I'm really happy now. Why? Because God has shown himself to be faithful. Hallelujah. I'm smiling today. Hallelujah. Why? Because I obeyed God and God is blessed Bethlehem. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Number seven, God promises he will expand your world and your influence when you give. Listen to what it says, Proverbs 11. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Wow. Wow. That's a scary one, isn't it? The world of the generous gets larger. When I'm generous, people love me. It's true. Whatever their motive is, my world gets larger. When I'm stingy and I hold on, my world gets smaller. My world gets smaller because the truth of the matter is some Christians eat the seed that God gives them. Now listen to me. You've got a choice. You can either plant the seed or eat the seed. You eat the seed, you die tomorrow. You plant the seed, you eat tomorrow. Come on, somebody. And your world expands. Amen? Number eight, God promises to store up treasures in heaven when you give. Paul tells us in Timothy chapter 6, verse 18, use your money to do good and give generously, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given you. By doing this, you will be storing up real treasures for yourself. It is the only safe investment for eternity. Wow. Jesus tells us, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make eternal friends. In this way, your generosity stores up a reward for you in heaven. You know, I remember this story about an evangelist. His name is Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday used to be a baseball player turned evangelist. And one day he was walking down the block with another Christian gentleman, and this man came over to Billy Sunday and said, I'm hungry, I need food, I'm hungry, would you help me? And Billy Sunday pulled out a couple of dollars and gave it to the man. And the other Christian man with Billy Sunday said, you know what he's going to do with that money. You know he's going to take that money, he's going to buy booze, he's going to get drunk, you just wasted $2. And Billy Sunday said, listen to me, every man has a decision to make. I have to make a decision to obey God and be generous. This man has to make a decision on how he's going to use the resources that I gave him. But when I get to heaven, I still get credit for $2. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Number nine, God promises us that he will open the window of heaven and pour us out a blessing so big, big that we cannot contain it. Now, come on. This is, this is the Bible. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm just telling you what the scriptures say. Here's what the Bible says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Don't bring 8%, bring 10%. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Don't bring what you want, bring what God requires. That there may be food in my house. 
He said, I want food in my house. I want seed in my house. I want resources in my house, in God's kingdom. God said, bring your first 10% into the storehouse. Bring the first 10% in the church. Give it to God. Give it to his kingdom. Give it to reach others. Give it to bless others. Give it as an act of gratitude. Give it cheerfully. Give it in faith and see what God will do. And he said, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that we'll, there will be no room in, enough for it but to store it. And I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you happy. Then all the nations will call you blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Now you might say, I've been tithing and God hasn't blessed. Oh really, he hasn't blessed you? I just want to tell you that everybody in this room is far richer than most people on the face of this planet. Don't ever forget that. Friend, you're richer than you think. You're more blessed than you think. And the truth of the matter is, is God has opened the window of heaven and he's poured you out a blessing and that blessing is Jesus Christ, hallelujah. That the greatest blessing that you could ever have is eternal life. And everything you invest in the kingdom of God will one day come back to you. It might not all come back to you today, but I promise you this one thing, God will never have to apologize to you when you get to heaven, because when you get to heaven, you are going to see the great rewards of giving in your life. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the promise of provision. David said in Psalms 37, I have been young and now I'm old. And in all my years, I have never seen the Lord forsake a man who loves him, nor have I seen their children begging for bread. So God, I thank you today that you promise us that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And God, sometimes you'll do it miraculously. So many times you do it through people. Sometimes you'll do it through circumstances. You'll close a door to open a door. But God, you'll always take the seed that we give you, Lord God, and you'll multiply that seed for the glory of your kingdom. My friend, the greatest gift that God has ever given us is his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you are far richer than you could ever imagine because you have Jesus. And friend, if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. Hallelujah. So can we be thankful for Jesus right now? Just like, can we, can we just say, Lord, even if I have little, I have learned to be content because I have all that I need in you. <laughs> you are my Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I recognize that there are some people in this room, you have some serious needs. Some of you have the need of peace in your life. And Jesus said, peace I give you, not as the world gives it. Some of you need joy in your life. Some of you need the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome something in your life. Some of you need freedom from addictions in your life. Some of you need Jesus to provide a healing for your body. Some of you, you need a financial miracle. Things are running out. But I believe that God today wants to let you know that he's going to always be on time. A miracle's on the way. Hallelujah. But if that's you today, as we all stand, if we all stand, if that's you today, as your pastor today, I'm, I'm going to stay here. I love to run in the back and 
shake the hands of everybody. I love you. Every one of you in this room, I pray for you and love you with all my heart. But today, as a senior pastor, I want to stay here and hug on people a little bit and love people and pray for people. So whatever the need is today, the Bible tells us that we're to pray, that we're to pray one for another, that where two or three are gathered in his name, agreeing on anything, it shall be done. And so if you have a need, whatever that need is today, why don't you just step out of your seat and come right here, stand at the altar and say, I have a need today. And I'm believing God that God's going to provide for the need. I want to pray with you today. We want to pray together as a family. Whatever it is, you have a need today. Just step out of your seat. We want to pray for you today. We want to pray for you today. The Bible says if, you, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick. The Bible tells us that when we gather together, we're to pray. Where two or three are gathered together, agreeing upon anything, it shall be done. So we're going to pray that God's going to meet your needs in a miraculous way. Anybody else, you need to come today. And this is not just about finances. This is about peace. This is about freedom. This is about strength. This is about God's grace in your life. Whatever, what is it that you need today? Come today. We want to pray for you today. Anybody else, you need to come. You just come right now. Yes, these are my needs today. And we're going to, we're going to sing that song that we sang in the beginning of the service, our Father who art in heaven. And that's the way that we're going to be dismissed today. It's going to be a song of thanksgiving to the Lord. It's going to be a song of praise to the Lord. And when we're done singing, you can be dismissed. God bless you. Don't forget, God, he has a plan for your life, and it's big. I love you. Have a great day. God bless you.